Welcome to this special edition of the Zeitgeist. Today, we're going to talk about what everybody's talking about, the coronavirus and COVID-19. Maybe some are tired of it and would like something different, and we'll do that some other time, but not in this episode, because we're fortunate to have with us today Germany's health minister, Jens Spahn. The globe is gripped by the pandemic, and Germany appears to many to be a success story of sorts. It has over 150,000 infections, um, but it has a low death rate. It has rolled out widespread testing. Its well-resourced health system has not been maxed out and has been able to cope with the patient load thus far. And the country has thoroughly implemented uh, a nationwide lockdown and social distancing and done that well enough that it now is starting to relax some of those restrictions. Inside Germany, though, the picture is more complicated. After an initial period of great solidarity, including from the mainstream opposition parties, the national government and the individual states are now uh, trying to return some elements of normal life and deciding how quickly that, that can proceed. So is it time for that? Um, or as Chancellor Merkel warned on April 23rd, is the country still on thin ice and needing a cautious approach. We can add other elements to that. It's the European and the global dimensions of the crisis, the economic impact, which is enormous uh, for Germany as well as for the United States. In sum, we are all struggling to conceive what the world after the pandemic uh, will look like and how long it will take us to get there. Rarely does so much depend on the talents, experience, and judgment of public officials and elected leaders. And that's why I'm so pleased Jens Spahn uh, took time to be our guest uh, today. He's one of Germany's youngest political leaders at age 39, but he has been a national figure for nearly two decades. I won't list his whole biography, but I will note that he was a candidate for the chairmanship of the Christian Democratic Union uh, in 2018, and he previously served as the deputy finance minister. He's been Germany's health minister since 2018, and that's not normally the job that gets you the uh, highest profile or is necessarily the easiest uh, to do. But in the last few months, uh, Jens Spahn has been one of the principal faces of Germany as it grapples with the COVID-19 pandemic um, at home as well as internationally. He's someone keenly aware of the interaction between politics, economics, and public health. Here's our conversation. Well, thank you, Minister Yen Spahn, for joining us today for, uh, for our discussion in this episode of our podcast, which we call The Zeitgeist. Um, I'm uh, really glad to talk with you about uh, Germany's experience dealing with the coronavirus uh, and also a bit about your policies um, and to, to see how they fit into a German and international context. Uh, you know, I'd like to start with testing because the response to the pandemic is multifaceted and testing is a crucial part of it. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how many tests Germany is conducting um, uh, at, the, at the moment for coronavirus? Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me, uh, Jeff. Uh, I, I'm just actually uh, uh, coming from a G7 phone call. So I just had a chat with your health minister, Alex Azar, as well on testing, by the way, as well. So, so far we have um, proceeded to 2 million tests here in Germany on uh, Corona. Um, which actually is one of our traditional strengths here in Germany. We have a very, very uh, broad network of labs all over the country traditionally. Uh, and that, of course, was very helpful from the very beginning in this. Uh, one of the first tests uh, was actually developed here in Berlin uh, of the Charité University. Um, and so actually from January on, we were able to really conducting uh, uh, tests all over the country. And, and that is important too, uh, the tests were covered by the public health system from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So actually people had access to it when needed. And, and th that's, that's very good. And what is the rate of testing? Do you have, uh, do you have uh, figures on how many tests you're doing per week or per day at this point? Well, the, the theoretical capacity would be more than 800,000 per week when uh, the, the kids are there. Uh, so right now we can have 350 to 400,000 tests per week. 
uh, up to 100,000 per day uh, uh, on, um, on an average five days a week. Um, okay. So actually, uh, so actually, uh, that is what we need right now. What we see is that there is no backlog; that all tests that are needed can be uh, can be done on the same day or the day after. Uh, and we focus on, on on the general population as soon as there are some symptoms or mm -hmm. if there is just someone that needs to be checked because of coming from a risk region or something. And more and more, we are focusing too on elderly care uh, houses and hospitals uh, because you know, you know, once you have uh, brought down again the dynamic of the outbreak like we have in Germany and managed to through the measures that were taken uh, then the the main um, uh, cluster of outbreaks is the, is, uh, the health system itself mm -hmm. uh, and so it's very important to to actually focus on that going for testing too and so I'd like to switch uh, there because you're talking also about uh, tracing of contacts of people who are infected which is another crucial part of the response um, and, and you've talked, to, and your government has talked about tracing every single contact of every single infected person. Is that in your grasp now? Are you capable of that? Or do you still need to expand your capacity to do that? Well, we, we, perhaps you, you might remember the first cases we had were the so-called Webasto cases. That's a German company here in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a company here in Germany, in Bavaria. Uh, and the first cases we had, we were really able to detect all cases and all the contacts they had. So for weeks, actually, we were, we were really um, able to, to manage uh, to, to, to break all the infectious chains uh, that were there immediately. So there yes. was no real uh, number, actually, uh, of, of cases. Then, uh, uh, actually, with the situation in North Italy developing uh, and people coming back from their winter holiday, actually from North Italy and Austria and, and Switzerland. Uh, we had more and more clusters here uh, in Germany uh, and the numbers mm -hmm. were rising in a way that actually we are not anymore uh, uh, able, the local authorities, to really trace uh, every contact. And now that we have brought numbers down again, uh, that is actually what is, is uh, doable, we are capable of right now, as of mm -hmm. today, uh, to trace the contacts, but still, it really needs uh, human resources because we need to talk to the infectious uh, one, ask who uh, he or she has met in the past, I don't know, days, if not uh, up to one or two weeks. Uh, and it's very hard to remember, actually, for the person. Right. And then you need to find the contacts, contact them and ask them to isolate themselves. And actually, that is the analog way. Uh, and we are, as many countries on the world, uh, trying to develop a digital way to do it as well. Okay, I think we'll come back to the digital uh, in, in a minute because that's also quite interesting. But I wanted to ask also about Germany's experience with easing some of the restrictions uh, as you've come out of the sort of lockdown phase uh, and, and now the states around, uh, around Germany are, are starting to relax um, some, some restrictions. And I think the, the important thing I'd like to remind our viewers and listeners about is that Germany is a federal system. So of course, uh, you as the minister can't simply uh, uh, order uh, everything to happen the way you would like. There's a negotiation process involved. Um, but still, the federal government remains overall in, in, in control of the response. So how do you calibrate and monitor uh, and control the relaxation of restrictions. Are there specific measurements that you're looking at, data um, that, uh, that is most important to you as, uh, as you look at the, um, uh, the, the lifting of, of some of these really uh, intensive measures? Well, first of all, for a free democracy like, like Germany or all of our Western countries, the measures we have, have taken are, are actually very hard to take. Uh, and for me, very difficult to take because of course you ch really change uh, all these people, uh, uh, people's life, uh, the freedom of movement, the freedom of just doing what you want to in, in, in some mm -hmm. context, just go to a restaurant or something. So that's really something you uh, need to have good reason for, and we had. Uh, but nevertheless, then you always need to check if it is still necessary or not, or if you can give a relief uh, or not to it. And that is what we do with a kind of step-by-step -step approach now. We have started the beginning of this week together with the federal states. Uh, for example, opening up uh, smaller shops again, uh, some mm -hmm. classes uh, go back to, uh, to go back to school. And now every two or three weeks, we just want to check, uh, does that make uh, a change uh, to, the, to the infectious uh, situation? 
do we see a, an increase of uh, infections here in Germany? Is it still manageable or not? And you always have a time lag, you know? Uh, you mm -hmm. can't see it within two days. You always need to wait at least exactly. two weeks till you really can figure out if it makes a difference or not. And then we might take the next step if we are still able to, to manage uh, the situation. Uh, I think this is a, a better approach than open it up too quick and then to realize that you need to go back two or three steps uh, because that is, uh, I would say that's a harder damage for re reliability uh, uh, of, of, of politics uh, and, and politicians, <laughs> by the way, as well. Uh, so <laughs> doing it step by step. Some, some people actually compared it to, to a child. You know, you, you, you offer a child to get uh, one piece of chocolate now or two pieces of chocolate in 15 minutes. And right. most children want the chocolate now and not to wait the 15 minutes. Uh, but in this situation, it's somehow a bit the same. You need to have patience and, and, and to give it time, but then uh, the chocolate might be bigger. Here we call that the marshmallow test. Um, yes. Although I think I would prefer the chocolate uh, to, to the marshmallow. Um, you've, you've mentioned the politics of this, um, and these are fundamentally political decisions that you and your colleagues and the chancellor are having to make. Um, and uh, you know the, the chancellor herself warned um, yesterday in her statement to the Bundestag about the dangers of moving too quickly to in a return to normal life, um, and and this is clearly becoming a, an element of political discussion in Germany. And uh, I, I noticed, for example, the leader of the of, of one of the main mainstream opposition parties yesterday, the Free Democrats. Uh, talk, uh, was quite critical of the government's um, explanations and rationale. So do you see this as an end of this period of kind of political solidarity and concord uh, that has uh, really uh, marked the last couple of months? Well, there, there was and there still is a broad consensus uh, in, in German society, actually, a big support for the measures taken and for the policy of the government, but still, Actually, to be honest, I would be worrying if there was no debate about what we are doing. This is a free, plural democracy. And of course, you need to debate uh, the actions taken by, by the government. And you need always to, to really make an argument why you are doing what or, or you are not doing what actually is, 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 is proposed by others. So that is quite normal. And I, I really want it to happen that we have a broad debate on this in society, as I said, these are the hardest measures taken in the Federal Republic of Germany ever uh, mm -hmm. uh, towards the population. So you need to have this debate. And at the same time, we need to explain day by day, me as the Minister of Health, the Chancellor, all of us, why we are doing what, uh, and try actually to keep the ex acceptance of, of, of the people. You know, most people, our my fellow Germans, actually, they do what they do, keeping distance, social distancing, um, uh, washing hands more often and all this. Uh, uh, they do what they do because they believe in it. I'm very, sh I'm very sure if they, if they were really felt forced to do it mm -hmm. by the state, but were not convinced, uh, this would actually not be doable. So we really need to explain good, uh, uh, very well what we are doing. Right. Um, I wanted to ask about another aspect of the, another political aspect. You know, you mentioned that this, these are the most intrusive measures a federal government has ever taken toward its citizens. Uh, if, if I compare this to the last major political crisis that Germany went through, I think it would probably be the 2015 migration crisis, which you know, led to a, which started off with a high degree of support for the, the government, but it also um, was exploited by the populist and far-right um, political elements. Um, and do you see potential for, for populist elements to exploit this crisis um, and to by attacking the competence of the state? There is, uh, without any doubt, there is a potential in all of our societies, actually, um, that there is a separation, kind of separation again of, of camps actually the the the, the, the reopen us and the, the ones who actually want the the, the slow more slowly approach uh, uh, to open up um, and actually if i you know when i take just the uh, the past days the previous days uh, you can see already uh, on, on social media but the emails i get or the political debate you can see it's getting more controversial which is per se no problem as long as there is a common understanding to of, of 
being one community that is actually negotiating something. But what you can see is the tone is getting harsher and harder. Uh, and and that, that somehow some people want the other ones uh, to say uh, to, 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 to say sorry actually for their position or to even uh, be very aggressive against them. Uh, and that is something we need to avoid. I don't want the same split uh, uh, within the society to happen uh, as we have seen it after the refugee situation uh, in September 2015 and, and, and winter 2015-16. Um, that was really a situation that, that developed to a very uh, a, yeah, politicized uh, and polarized country actually and society here in Germany and I would say even to many European countries uh, and we need definitely to avoid the same situation and as I said again that needs a, a good style of debate all arguments need to be on the table uh, and it, you, you need to be allowed to say everything you, you want to as long as there is a common understanding this is one community one society one nation uh, dealing with and uh, negotiating um, an issue uh, and trying to solve a problem together. As long as we have that common understanding, you can stand a controversial debate. As soon as you start to separate in different kind of different societies, that's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. My personal comment uh, is uh, that I think the, the far right has uh, demonstrated that they have very few solutions um, uh, to, to these problems uh, of a pandemic, uh, and I think that's been pretty clear. They are always better in describing problems than in solving problems, and that is actually, uh, I always say the best tool against populists is just solving problems and, and just taking up the, the, the debates that are there. I mean, there are, for example, people that have children, mm -hmm. uh, and now kindergartens are closed, I don't know, for, for six weeks or something. Of course, it's very hard for them. And of course, there are very big emotions uh, yeah. in this and in this uh, debate. And, and we need to make clear that we know their difficult situation. And at the same time, we need to explain why we haven't opened up kindergartens yet, uh, at least not all of them for all of them. Right. Um, if I could switch to the uh, economic um, uh, side, uh, and in particular, I think this crisis has, has brought home to the average citizen, um, the dependency of our modern economies on international supply chains, whether we're talking about the personal protective equipment for medical professionals like masks or medical supplies and reagents for conducting tests. Um, uh, Germany, as the United States and other countries have been scrambling to create a domestic capacity to produce these, uh, these things. Um, do you see that as the long-term future uh, a less globalized medical supply uh, industry and perhaps uh, more, more generally? Or is this a temporary, uh, a temporary phenomenon? Well, in general, Jeff, I would say the world after Corona won't be the same as before. I can't tell you if it is better or worse after. I will do everything that is better. Uh, but uh, regarding trade and world trade, for example, I'm very sure that that will be a different situation and we will have uh, new approaches. Um, for us as Germany, for example, and as Europe, there are two sides of it. There's the one side that we are too dependent on a certain region, a certain country, uh, China, for example, uh, when it comes to, to uh, medical equipment, protective equipment for our healthcare workers, when it comes to drugs, uh, for example. And at the same time, we are very dependent on these markets too. You know, our car industry, for example, is not on a still stand because of political decisions. It's on a still stand because all the markets all over the world are closed and they are very much depending, Mercedes, BMW, a Porsche, uh, depending with Volkswagen uh, on the Chinese market. So actually from both sides, uh, and I'm sure that's going to happen and the debate is already there, we need to change. We need to define what is the right balance for globalization and what needs to be produced again, not, not in Germany, but in Europe, uh, uh, together within the European Union. There are certain areas like drugs. And on the other hand, uh, actually, we need, to, we need to define how we can uh, have a diversification of our trading partners, uh, that we are not so depending on just one big country for selling our products. I understand. One last question. You've been very generous with your time, and that's on the digital uh, aspect. Um, you know, Germany is looking as other countries to find ways to use digital um, technologies, including uh, smartphone apps, to, to aid the public health response. Uh, and there's been, of course, uh, a lot of uh, uh, debate about it. 
we all realize that Germany is especially sensitive to privacy considerations um, for, for many historical reasons. Um, do you think this focus on privacy and the need to adapt to uh, a pandemic, are those things in conflict? Uh, do you think Germany is going to need to change its, its approach to privacy in order to, to use technology most effectively? Well, first of all, I would say, um, uh, I mean, this, this whole this, uh, situation of this outbreak of this virus, this uh, pandemic, is actually doing harm to privacy and freedom. <laughs> I mean, the measures we've taken uh, are doing uh, as well. And, and the tracing ad is a chance, actually, to get out of this situation. That is how I uh, always want to describe it. That's a tool, mm -hmm. actually, for this uh, time of a pandemic uh, that actually would help us to give a relief and to get back our freedom because then we could be better in actually breaking uh, uh, the, the chains of, of, of the infections. And nevertheless, there is a debate as there must be one, but uh, without going into detail, what I'm always wondering about in, in the German debate at least is there's a general trust somehow in uh, American companies like Apple or Google or Facebook when it mm -hmm. comes to their personal data, the, uh, but there's a general mistrust against your own uh, state uh, with all the clear regulation that actually we do have for privacy, uh, pro for private data. And somehow this debate is the same, you know, it's a very much driven by the Apple and Google uh, 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 approach so that they want to have decentralized data on the, on, on, on the mobile itself. Mm -hmm. and, and we say, you know, for, for, for really tracing uh, people, you at least, like in the analog world, you need at least to know who is uh, uh, infectious and, and what were the contacts. I mean, we do the same right now. We do it now by calling and talking. Uh, that would be just a digital way, but we yeah. still need to have that information. Uh, so that is actually the right balance between decentralized information on the mobile and centralized information, at least anonymously, uh, uh, on, uh, 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 on a central uh, server. Uh, but as I said, I always wonder how much the belief of the German is uh, in, in Facebook and Apple, which are, of course, very good uh, US companies, but nevertheless, uh, how big the mistrust is when it comes to, uh, 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 to their own government actually trying to set up a framework and a clear regulation for something like this. Okay. Well, Minister Yen Spahn, um, I want to thank you for your time and for your um, uh, answers to all these important questions. I want to wish you and your government and the German people uh, all the very best in uh, coming through this crisis as quickly as possible. Uh, and in, uh, you know, our mission is to strengthen the German-American relationship, and you've helped us uh, do that today by uh, deepening understanding of, of the situation uh, in Germany and we look forward to remaining in contact in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you very much uh, as well, and all the best for, for the US uh, and the American people in this uh, too. Uh, I, I mean, I just can say, uh, uh, say uh, actually how hard is, it is to see the pictures uh, uh, and, and the, uh, uh, what actually the situation in New York, for example, and uh, where we can be of any help we want to be. Uh, for that, it is important to have the exchange uh, of views, of data, of information that we have, of approaches. Uh, that is why we had this G7 call, by the way. It is just very, very much important to, to uh, exchange uh, uh, views and information. That is, by the way, why I'm so much in favor of the World Health Organization with all the problems there are in the governance and that need to be de debated later. But it's important to have this international uh, uh, network. Uh, and as you just said, it's very important for us to uh, deepen the transatlantic partnership uh, uh, these days again. And uh, for that, I'm very grateful that you gave me the chance for this. Uh, and uh, now, with keeping distance, I wish you a nice weekend. Thanks very much. All the best. All the best.